Get your window down! You want something? Uh, probably drunk. You're going the wrong way! What? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you. You're going to kill somebody! You're going the wrong way! What? Fuck. Why? <laughs> So which way are you going these days? Man, I miss John Candy. That classic movie clip from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles really depicts part of the role, a big part of the role that prophets play throughout the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. And as we go through this series of sermons during the season of Lent called The Heart of God, they reveal God's heart. Turn from the evil road that you're traveling, Jeremiah proclaims. But these aren't Jeremiah's words. This is not Jeremiah waking up one day and saying, you know, I feel like people are going the wrong way, so I want them to turn around. In fact, Jeremiah is a reluctant prophet. They're almost always the best ones. The ones that you wouldn't expect would be the prophets and the Bible teachers and the preachers, the people who resist. And certainly the story of a lot of the preachers around hope is like, our friends are really shocked that we're preachers, that, that we're actually pastors. Turn from the evil road. He's proclaiming God's word. You're going the wrong way. You need to turn around. Because this road you're on, you might think, oh, they're, those prophets, they're drunk. They're just crazy. They make a bunch of noise. They say things that really don't hold any water. They're just a bunch of religious freaks. What do they know? Oh, what they know is what God has revealed to them and what they see is you're going the wrong way and you're going to get hurt. So Jeremiah proclaims God's words. He says, thus saith the Lord. Turn from the evil road that you're traveling and from the evil things that you're doing. And in a, in a world that sometimes feel like the pathway we're on is a bowl of spaghetti where, where all the roads and the signs are moving in different directions, it's good for us to know the way. Wherever this city is, I, I love their sense of humor that they're like, well, this is a pretty complicated intersection, so good luck. <laughs> Even in the New Testament, when Jesus was hanging out with his disciples, he says to them, he says, I'm going to go away. This little three-year tour we've been on is almost over, and the disciples are heartbroken. Of course, Jesus is more specific than that. He says, I'm going to be handed over to the authorities, betrayed, handed over, crucified and three days later rise from the dead. They're heartbroken to hear this. They like the, the journey they're on. They like the tour, the way it's going. Sell out crowds wherever they go. Jesus is walking on water. He's healing the sick. He's opening the eyes of the blind. He's teaching with this new revelation and this authority. And, and, and it, 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 it's like this fresh wind is blowing in. We don't want that to end. And they're heartbroken. And so Thomas speaks on behalf of several of them, I'm sure. Thomas, you know, who has the reputation and the nickname of being the doubter, Doubting Thomas. He says, we don't, we don't know where you're going. Jesus says, don't worry. I, you know, I'm, I'm going, but, but you know where I'm going. And Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And truth be told, maybe all of us feel that way sometimes. Where we don't know. God, I know you have a way. You say you have, Jesus says, I'm the way. And it leads to the truth, which leads to the life. I just wish I knew what that way was. I, and, and much more practically, instead of just, you know, pie in the sky spirituality, I wish I knew what that meant in my day-to-day -day life. Like, should I do this or that? What, if I'm at a crossroads, how do I know which way is from you? How do I know your will? How do we know your way? Okay, let's say... For argument's sake, we want to go your way, God. How do we know your way? And how do we know it's better? 
In order to discover God's way, we have to discover the heart of God, which is the name of the sermon series we're in during the season of Lent. This is week three of six weeks, 40 days leading up to the celebration of Easter, and we're talking about the heart of God, which is a subset of an even bigger theme this year as a church that we're saying our theme as a church is we want to be a church after God's own heart. We don't want to play church. We don't want to go through the motions. We don't want to fake it. We don't, we don't want to water it down. We, we, we don't want to play game like it's some sort of church game. We really want to do what the Bible says David did, and both in the Old Testament and New Testament. It says David was a man after God's own heart. Well, we want to be a church after God's own heart. But in order to be a church after God's own heart, we have to know God's own heart. And the Bible reveals that. And one of the best ways the Bible reveals the heart of God is through his prophets. In the Old Testament, prophets like Jeremiah, our Bible reading for today. Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet or the crying prophet. And it's because his heart broke for the things that broke God's heart. I will weep alone. This isn't Jeremiah prophesying. This is Jeremiah reflecting on the prophecies that he has to proclaim, the truth, the tough truth, the tough love that he has to proclaim to a wandering world that's going the wrong way. And like John Candy and Steve Martin's characters in that movie clip, they're about to get hurt or somebody else is going to get hurt. And it makes me cry. And Jeremiah is crying. His tears are reflecting the heart of God. God's tears. God's grief over the wandering of his people and the outcome of that wandering. I'll weep alone, Jeremiah says, because of your pride, God's people, your pride, Israel, Judah, Jerusalem. My eyes will overflow with tears because the Lord's flock will be led away into exile. Jeremiah isn't just the crying and weeping prophet. He's also a very colorful prophet. If you believe that Old Testament prophetic books are boring, you probably are revealing too much that you're saying, I've never read them. Because Jeremiah, I mean, he would have used movie clips, I'm sure. He used uh, visual aids and sermon illustrations all the time. Prophetic illustrations in his case. Well, in this one, God told him to. He says, Jeremiah, as these men who are the leaders of Israel watch you, I want you to smash the jar that you brought with you. Then say, as this jar, this is pretty harsh, by the way. I should, this should come with a warning. Like, before you read the rest of this verse, this might be a little uncomfortable, all right? Because this is God saying this about his people. As this jar lies shattered, so I will shatter the people of Judah beyond repair. So in order to give you a sense of what it's like to be in the presence of Jeremiah, I brought this jar. I'm preaching five sermons this weekend. I got five jars, so you might want to brace yourselves in the front. Ready? One. No, I'm not going to do it because God didn't call me to do it. And see, that's the difference between true prophets and false prophets. If you get it, say got it. Get it? We have to know the context, not just the text. We have to understand that this is what God called Jeremiah to say to a particular people in a particular time. You say, well, thank goodness, because I don't want God to smash us like a jar beyond repair. One of the big heresies in Christianity and the church today is false prophets who rise up and say, hey, don't worry, because of who we are, we're going to be just fine. We're Israel back in Jeremiah's day. We're God's chosen people. And Israel can do no wrong. Again, people who say things like Israel can do no wrong haven't read the Old Testament. Because Israel's always doing things wrong in the Old Testament. And sometimes to the point where God says, because I'm a God of justice, I can't let this evil persist anymore. I'm not going to protect you from the consequences of your sin. I'm not going to turn a blind eye to the way you let injustice run rampant in your culture. I'm not going to turn a blind eye to your immorality that's so dark you're starting to sacrifice children because it's become this trendy thing that you do, spiritually trendy. I'm not going to turn a blind eye to your idolatry. And this is where Christians get too comfortable in our day. We say, well, uh, you know, we don't worship idols. I don't have a, an altar in my living room at home, and I have some sort of statue of a false god there that I bow down and worship. Since I don't do that, then I'm not an idol worshiper. But the biblical definition 
of idol worship is putting anything above God in your life, putting anything above God in my life. That could be my hobbies, that could be my family, that could be my friendships, that could be uh, anything that I pursue, that could be my community, that could be my favorite sports team, that could be my nation, all sorts of good, all potentially really good things. But they make lousy gods. And that's the problem with worshiping a nation above God. That's the problem with worshiping a hobby above God. That's the problem with worshiping a career above God. That's the problem with worshiping our kids above God. Or or living our whole lives to, to, to turn them into human doings instead of human beings. Little performers. We're going the wrong way. We're going the wrong way when we just blindly follow the ways of the world and and become zombies to to, to looking at social media screens all day long, we're going the wrong way. That doesn't mean that social media, careers, our country, any of these things are necessarily bad things. They can be good things. You can be passionate about all these things, but they make lousy gods. And just because you're Israel doesn't mean you can't get shattered. Just because you're Israel back then or even today doesn't mean that you might not wander away from God's will. You don't get a free pass because you're Israel. You don't get a free pass because you're the USA. You don't get a free pass because you're a son or a daughter of of God. We don't get free passes because of our status. That's what God is revealing. If we want to know the heart of God, if we want to know the way of God, we have to get less comfortable in some ways where we're getting too spiritually comfortable. We need to be challenged and afflicted to say, God actually does care about our morality. God actually does care when we don't stand up against injustice. God actually does care when we don't care about the stranger or or, or welcoming the strangers into our world. God actually does care when when we we allow the death of innocence. God actually does care and turn a blind eye to it. God actually does care when we gossip about people behind their backs. God actually does care when we participate in the division of this country and ignore the fact that Jesus, you know, our Lord, commanded and said, blessed are the peacemakers. To pursue God's own heart sometimes is uncomfortable because it doesn't fit in with the false idols and gods that we've made where we say, okay, God, you have to now follow our false idols and we're gonna try to shape you and form you to sound just like the people we wanna follow because they tell us what our itching ears wanna hear as the Bible calls it later in the New Testament. It's not easy being Jeremiah in a world that's teetering on destruction a nation that's teetering on destruction. The other, maybe equally dangerous heresy is to read that and hear that and say, yes, that's right. And the United States is Israel today and we're teetering too. And so, so, so this word is really not for Israel back then. This word is directly for us in the United States today. We've got to get back to where we once were. I'm a passionate student of history. I just do it for fun. I I read everything I can read. I watch documentaries like I'm eating candy. My wife makes fun of me all the time, but I just love it. There's, even the stuff I disagree with, I, I want to read it. I, I, I want to I have a vast understanding of these things. And lately, I've been focused on what I would call the last century of American history. You can call it contemporary American history, whatever it is. And I do believe in a lot of ways our world's in trouble. Our, our, our culture, our nation is in trouble. And there are some things that need to change. Absolutely big things. And I think we have God's word on that. Even though he's directly proclaiming this for Israel, and it's indirect at best for us, let me put this right out there right now, as clearly and simply as I can. The United States of America, that's a phrase that never shows up anywhere in the Bible. That doesn't mean God doesn't have words for us. That doesn't mean God doesn't have direction for us. That doesn't mean God doesn't have warnings for us. God does. But it does mean When we bow down and worship the nation above God, we've got the whole thing backwards. That we should be testing the leaders based on what God's word says. We shouldn't be testing God based on what our leaders say. And when we do that, we end up with shattered jars all over the place. We end up with messes. We end up being susceptible to all sorts of uh, of darkness. And that's what was happening in Jeremiah's day. As I read through contemporary, the last century American history or world history, 
you start to realize it wasn't even a century ago that a ruthless fascist leader named Hitler rose up and exacted a holocaust on people simply because of who they were, because they were Jewish. In the midst of the world war that we fought against Hitler and Japan, uh, along comes this movement and the Oppenheimer movie that's getting so much attention that will probably sweep the Academy Awards for good reason, tells the story of this complicated, brilliant scientist named Oppenheimer who um, feels like he's serving his country alongside of these other brilliant scientists by creating a bomb that's going to end war and hopefully could end all wars and bring peace to this world in a way that it's never had before. But it's complicated. And there are layers to it. And we know from history, not the movie, but history, we know out of that, yep, the war did end. World War II ended because of that bomb. And it wouldn't have ended without that bomb when it ended, the way it did. There's no doubt about that. But shortly thereafter, the Cold War starts bubbling up. If you're old enough like me to remember when you're in second grade, you didn't just do fire drills and tornado warning drills, you did atomic bomb drills where you would go out in the hallway and, and find your place in case the Soviet Union was attacking us with atomic bombs. The end of the world as we knew it. I remember when I was seven years old and I was like, well, this stinks. This is terrible that somebody I don't know that lives on the other side of the globe could push some buttons and, and wipe us all out. The world isn't just kind of drifting now and wandering away from God and going the wrong way now. If you read history, you realize it's sort of our thing as human beings. We're really good at wandering away from God and from his will. We have a real, we've made a real habit out of it over and over and over again. And so into those kinds of places, into ancient Israel, into modern day countries and, uh, uh, the, the, that are on the globe today, including ours, God has words for us. Even if our country isn't named in the Bible, God has direction for us. And God has direction not just for us as communities and as nations, God has direction for us as individuals. So which way are you going? Jeremiah wasn't just a colorful prophet and a weeping prophet, he was also a um, rap battle prophet. Well, not really. But I don't know how else to put it. There was another prophet in Jeremiah's time called Hananiah, and if you've read the Old Testament prophecies, you know that one of the big questions is, how do you know if it's a true prophet or a false prophet? And Jeremiah makes it very clear. He says, Hananiah, we'll know if your prophecy, your poetry, your rap is true instead of my poetry, my rap, or I don't know which way is Jeremiah, let's say this is Jeremiah and this is Hananiah. We'll know who's really the true prophet of God over time, based on are the things that we're saying are going to happen, will they happen? And if they don't happen, guess what? You're a false prophet. So Hananiah starts the rap battle with Jeremiah. They both show up in the same public forum, and Hananiah says, here's my rap, here's my poet, here's my prophecy. Don't worry, be happy. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry, be happy. It's all good. Don't worry about King Nebuchadnezzar the ruthless leader of Babylon. Don't worry about the fact that we've divided God's people. You know, that united kingdom that David reigned over as the great king has now fractured into two different kingdoms because we couldn't get along and it made us both weaker and susceptible to hostile takeovers from neighboring nations and enemies. And sure enough, over a century ago, Jeremiah could say the Assyrians were taken over and put into exile. I'm sorry, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken over by the Assyrians and brought into exile, and now there's just us, Jerusalem, Judah. That's all that's left of the Israelites living in their homeland. And here comes Nebuchadnezzar, who makes the Assyrians look like a warm-up act. This is the Babylonian Empire. This is the great Babylon. And it's not just biblical like stories, this is historical truth. Here comes Babylon. They're knocking on the door of Judah, threatening to take over. And here comes Hananiah says, Thus says the Lord, don't worry about it. Within two years, Nebuchadnezzar will be out of the picture. Uh, Babylon's nothing to worry. They're our buddies. They're our pals. No problem at all. We're going to be fine. Jeremiah says, amen. I hope that what you're saying is true, but I know it's not. I wish that it were true, but I know it's not. 
And that's how I know you're a false prophet. And history bears this out. Jeremiah stands up and says, you're going the wrong way, Israel. You need to turn around. And God isn't going to protect you from the consequences of your sin then or now if you go your own way. You're going the wrong way, Christian. And God isn't going to protect you of the consequences of your sin if you don't go his way. And sometimes, I know this isn't like the easy sermon to preach or to hear, but sometimes we need to hear the revelation of God's word because it's the loving thing to do. It's not loving to see somebody driving in a car heading for a cliff that's going to lead to to absolute destruction for them. It's not loving for us to say, hey, don't worry, be happy. Looks like you're having a fun drive. You just keep doing you. You just keep going the way you're going. It's all good, baby. Don't worry, be happy. That's what Han- that was Hananiah's message. And he said, this is where you have to be discerning. And be careful not to just follow what your itching ears want to hear. Once in a while, I hope your faith gets challenged. Or you might have to ask, is this really following Jesus? If I get to call all the shots, if I get to tell Jesus who he is, if I get to define God in my own image, once in a while it's good to be challenged. Once in a, maybe more than once in a while, it's good to be challenged. To be, so maybe I'm getting too spiritually comfortable. Maybe I'm getting too relaxed. Maybe I'm letting a lot of injustices in the world around me go. Maybe I'm not standing up against the people who are gossiping about everybody else at school or at work or in my neighborhood. Maybe I'm not pushing back. Maybe it's time for me to be a better ambassador of Jesus Christ in the world. Maybe it's time for me to be challenged in my faith. Maybe it's time for me to stop being so comfortable in thinking that my God bows down to my nation or or, or that my God bows down to my hobbies or that God's totally cool with me doing whatever I want and worshiping all these false idols and making something bigger than him. We could water down the gospel. I could give you Hananiah sermons. Don't worry, be happy. It's all good. What you're doing is great. What I'm doing is great. We don't, we don't have to change anything. But that's not loving. It's not loving to let people continue, to let myself continue to go this way, to let you continue to go this way. God won't let us. And so he reveals his heart through his prophets. And he says, you're going the wrong way. Please turn around because if you don't, you're going you're gonna to be taken over by the Babylonians, Israel, and you're going to be pushed into exile. And it won't just be for a two or three year global pandemic. It'll be for 70 years. You won't even be able to live in your homes anymore. For two plus generations, you're going to be in exile. And sure enough, that's how history has been written. That's exactly what happened. So who's the true prophet? The one who tells us what we want to hear? Or the one who loves us enough to speak truth? God's truth into this world. God, turns out, cares about our morality. Cares about how we relate to one another. Cares about how we talk about each other. Cares about how we treat one another. Turns out God cares about the injustices in this world and calls his church to rise up and stand against them. Turns out God cares when we make other things more important than him. When other things get priority in our lives. Because it's not just some, well, I'm a jealous God and and I need you to bow down to me and and because I just do because I need that. God doesn't need us. We need God. And it's because God loves us. This is the heart of God. Because God loves us, he says, look, you're going the wrong way. When you make anything more important than me, it doesn't end the way you think it's going to end. It's not going to end well for you. And so Jeremiah reveals the heart of God. And what's revealed in Jeremiah is really kind of disturbing and challenging. But hold on. Hold on. That's not the whole story. We're going to turn the page to page two, Paul Harvey, and now here's the rest of the story in just a minute. But let's get down to the bottom of page one first. Sometimes it feels like this world is falling apart. You ever say that? You ever hear that? You ever think that? And sometimes it's not just the news of the day. Sometimes it's the personal things that you're up against. Sometimes you can make this way more personal and say, sometimes it can feel like my world is falling apart. My life. My relationships, my health. Sometimes I'm so, so filled with sorrow and grief over the death or the suffering of a loved one, I, 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 just, I can hardly breathe. 
Any of you who've grieved somebody very close to you know just how debilitating that feeling is. Just how hard it is to navigate that. Sometimes it can feel like my world. Sometimes it can feel like your world. Sometimes it can feel like our whole world is falling apart. And the first thing Jeremiah would say is, yeah, it does, and it happens, and that's real. Jesus says, in this world you're going to have trouble. He doesn't say, don't worry, be happy. He says, in this world it's, it's going to be tough because there are consequences to our sin, to our rebellion. And when we go the wrong, if we drive toward a cliff and drive off of it, we're going to die. That's not God's fault when he calls us to go his way instead of that way. Because God loves us, he sends prophets to say, turn around. You were made for more than this. And sometimes the rubble happens. Sometimes the clay jars are smashed to smithereens. It happens. But the second thing Jeremiah says is where we go to page two. Where we get to turn the page. And this isn't just sort of a, you know, try to make it a little bit better. This is something that actually supersedes everything that happened before. It's but God. All of us have sinned and fallen short, the scriptures declare, but God redeems us through the blood of Jesus Christ. For us trying to fix this world and put the pieces of this shattered clay jar of our lives back together again, we have no hope. It's impossible. But God, but with God all things are possible. They laid his body in a tomb but God raised him from the dead. This is what Jeremiah starts to proclaim right in the middle of his warnings, right in the middle of his, hey, you're going the wrong way, right in the middle of, hey, don't listen to these false prophets. Jeremiah says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with you. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and following. Our Bible reading for today. It won't be like the old covenant. It'll be a new covenant. The old covenant, God wrote his laws on stone tablets, the top 10 list, the 10 commandments, gave them to Moses and said, here's the covenant. Here's the deal. Here's the agreement. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. I'll give you my laws that will bless your life. If you follow them, you'll have better relationships. You'll have a better life. You'll live for the right things. You'll go the right way. My laws on these stone tablets tell you which way to go. And they tell you when you're going the wrong way. Biblically, most important use of the law is it becomes a mirror for us that shows us when we're going the wrong way. So we can't justify the adultery. We can't justify the stealing. We can't justify the bearing false witness against neighbor. We can't justify the coveting. We can't justify having any God before the one true God. We can't justify not remembering the Sabbath day. We can't justify not honoring our parents. We can't justify not honoring God's name. Those are the Ten Commandments in a very random order. I don't even know what's happening in my brain sometimes. But it was all ten. So God in the Old Covenant writes out directions, GPS coordinates. Here's the step-by-step -step directions. I'll put it on a map for you, God says. I'll put it on stone tablets. Do this and don't do the things this says not to do. That's my way. But Jeremiah says that's the Old Covenant. Thus says the Lord. The days are coming when he'll write a new covenant and he won't inscribe it on stone tablets. Better than that, he's going to write it on your heart. He's going to give you a conscience filled with his Holy Spirit so that you know when you talk about people behind their backs, you're going the wrong way. You know when you're dividing this world and participating in the division of this country, you're going the wrong way when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. You know when you cheat on your spouse, you're going the wrong way, hard as you try to justify it, because she or he's not meeting my needs. Well, then get some counseling and work on it. You know you're going the wrong way when you start to put anything above God, including hobbies, family, friends, nation, favorite team, Caitlin Clark setting the record today, which I'll be there for. That'll be awesome. But it's not my God. I hope it's, not your, I hope it's not the thing you're living for. Because if it is, if any of those things are, there's disappointment down the road for you. Even if you get all those things, it won't be enough. So here comes God. But God. They laid his body in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Our sins are there, but God forgives our sins. With us, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Everyone say, but God.
but God brings a new covenant. And so that puts our worries and our fears for this world that's falling apart or for my world when it's falling apart, it puts them in a whole new perspective. A prophet from not very long ago, Billy Graham, put it this way. I believe proclaiming God's word. He says, when our hopes are centered on anything short of God, idolatry. Anxiety is the natural result. Our worries start to grow. Our concerns start to grow. Our anxiety starts to grow. Because we're putting our faith in things that deep down we start to discover and it starts to be revealed to us. They don't have the potential to fix this. They don't have the potential to put the pieces back together. But God does. But God shows up. If you don't hear anything else I say in the sermon today, go home chewing on this. As we pursue God's heart this year as a church, our theme, to be a church after God's own heart, understand that God is pursuing your heart. God is chasing after your heart, relentlessly pursuing your heart, not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go. You're going the wrong way, he might say to me. He might say to you today. He might say to us. He might say to nations of our world. It might be revealed through his prophet. You're going the wrong way. You're not following the laws that I inscribed on the stone tablets. You're not following the laws that I have written onto your hearts. You're going the wrong way and you know it. Stop living for the things that put you on the wrong pathways. Even if they're just a few degrees off from God, they're going to end in a place you don't want to be. Like my drive off the first tee at a golf course. Even if it's just a couple of degrees off, I'm ending up out of bounds in the woods. You're going the wrong way, the prophets declare the word of God. So that we don't have to deal with the anxiety that's the natural result of living for something that we were never made to live for. Let's pull back here as we start to land the plane and take a 30,000 foot view. Sometimes I think we move so fast through these sermon series that we don't take the time to see how the puzzle pieces fit together. Week one, this is what we preached on. Week two, last week we preached on this. This is the season of Lent series, the heart of God. And today we're preaching on this. Week one, God is the creator. He's the life maker. He, he's a God of provision. He, he gives us the Garden of Eden that has everything we need. He, he creates human life. Adam, which means mankind, and Eve are in the garden. And he gives us one law. Don't eat the, fruit of the, for, the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can eat all the other fruit from all the other trees all throughout the garden. Don't eat that fruit. But of course, Adam and Eve, we, the human, human race, falls and paradise is lost. Then last week you heard sermons. I had the weekend off. So we heard some great sermons from the preachers here at Hope about a God who makes covenants with us, makes covenants with Noah, says I'll never destroy the earth again. Here's a rainbow, a rainbow to seal the promise of this covenant. He makes covenants with Moses. Here's, here's the seal of the covenant. I'm inscribing my, my, my GPS coordinates, my, my step-by-step directions on these stone tablets. I'm making this old covenant with you. Covenant synonymous for testament. This is the Old Testament. I'm bonding with you. I don't want to just be your creator. I want to be your God. I want to be in a relationship with you. And so that's the deal. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. I'll tell you how to live and you'll live that way. But we wander away. And the result of that is, well, the consequences of our sin. And for Israel, it was exile. And then in this transition is where we see Jeremiah in the midst of talking about this wandering and this exile and telling the world we're going the wrong way, he starts to surprisingly change his whole tone because God reveals this to him. But God, yes, the world is falling apart. We don't have to deny that. We don't have to pretend it isn't happening. But God shows up and makes all things new. God puts the pieces back together of the shattered clay jar. But God... God is the God of tomorrow. He's the God of redemption. Everyone say redemption. He's, he's the God of the new covenant, the new testament, sealed by Jesus Christ in the upper room at his last supper with the disciples, the Passover meal. The old covenant was, hey, we're going to share a Passover meal every year, and we're going to bring out very specific instructions about the food we eat, the wine we drink, and, and we're going to remember how God passed over with the angel of death, our homes, setting us free from slavery into the freedom of a new life in a promised land. 
Jesus is doing the same, setting us free from the bondage of sin by the blood of him, the blood of the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. And so he takes the bread of the Passover meal and he says, from now on, new, you remember the old covenant. You remember how this reminded you of the manna from he, or, or, or the bread from heaven that God provided. Now new covenant, this bread now, whenever you eat it, remember this is my body given for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. And this wine from the Passover meal, that old covenant is, remember we painted the blood of the lambs, the offering lambs on the doorposts of our homes so the angel of death would pass over. Now new covenant, this cup of wine is now my blood. This is a new covenant in my blood, a new covenant. A new deal in my blood promised for you. God makes a promise in this new covenant and he keeps a promise by then going to the cross the next day and shedding his blood and giving up his body for us. I'll write my laws on your hearts and this will be your hope and your salvation. But remember the Bible says today is the day of salvation. People get this wrong all the time. They say our hope is once we finally get out of this messed up world, we'll be in heaven. That's true, but it's better than that. The heart of God reveals an even better truth through his prophets, through his written word. And I'm excited to announce it to you today. The Bible says today is the day of our salvation. Not the day we die and we get saved and get into heaven. The day you and I admit and confess we're going the wrong way. As my favorite theology professor in seminary, Dr. Gerhard Ferdi, who's one of the most brilliant theologians of the last century, I mean, 20% of what he said nobody understood except him. But in the realm of that 80%, he says, here's a simple but profoundly deep truth and one that the church gets wrong all the time in the world today. We tell people, hey, it's all about you, your performance, getting better, getting it right. But that's wrong, he says. The way we get right with God is by admitting we're sinners in need of a savior. We become saints when we admit we're sinners, not when we pretend to be saints. We experience God at the deepest levels when we realize God finds us in our ditches finds us in our wanderings, finds us in our sin, and redeems us. Everyone say redemption. Say redemption. Yes. So we are redeemed by this new covenant that's promised by God. It is our hope for salvation to eternal life someday in heaven, yes, but it's also our hope of salvation into a whole new life right now where our fears, as the prophet Billy Graham says, are put in a whole new perspective where we don't have the anxiety that has to overwhelm us and overcome us because we say, oh my goodness, lions and tigers and bears, this whole world is falling apart. That may be true, but God, but God shows up and he's bigger. The darkness may be real, but God's light overwhelms it. When you turn a light on in a room, the darkness runs. It hides. God's light is greater than the darkness. God's hope is greater than our despair. God's life, eternal and new, is greater than our death and the consequences of our sin. But God, this is the way. You want to know the way? One more movie clip to wrap things up and another classic spiritual movie. Lloyd and Harry are trying to get to Aspen, California. That's what they say, and they find out it's in Colorado instead. And on the way, as Harry wakes up one day, he says to Lloyd, who's driving their very interesting van, he says, well, I thought the Rocky Mountains would be a little rockier than this. Why are they not seeing the Rocky Mountains as they move from Nebraska to Colorado? Because they're going the wrong way. Take a look. Come on! Stop being a baby! So we backtracked a tad! A tad! A tad, Lloyd! You drove almost a sixth of the way across the country in the wrong direction! Now we don't have enough money to get to Aspen, we don't have enough money to get home, we don't have enough money to eat, we don't have enough money to sleep! Well, it's not going to do us any good to sit here whining about it. We're in a hole. 
We're just gonna have to dig ourselves out. Okay, all right, you're right. You're absolutely right, Lloyd. Where are you going? Home. I'm walking home. Oh, well, pardon me, Mr. Perfect. I guess I forgot that you never ever make a mistake. Got room for one more if you still want to go to Aspen. Where did you find that? Some kid back in town. Traded the van for it, straight up. I can get 70 miles to the gallon on this hog. You know, Lloyd, just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber, you go and do something like this. And totally redeem yourself! <laughs> I told you it was a spiritual movie. Total redemption. That's not the way to find it, though. Trading your van straight up for a moped is not going to lead you to total redemption. So where's that road? That leads to total redemption for us, for you, for me, for Israel in Jeremiah's day. Forgiveness for all our mistakes. Because I forgot you never ever do anything wrong, Mr. Perfect. And a whole new start in life. It's the Jesus who says, new covenant. The Jesus who says, follow me. The Jesus who says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. And you know this Jesus, he's written into your hearts. Oh, it could be covered up. It, layers and layers of this world's philosophies and opinions and thoughts. Peel those back. Get back to Jesus. And understand that before you go home, we're, we're going to have a meal with an amazing celebrity here. The one who's the way, the truth, and the life, who says, follow me. I, I'm your GPS coordinates. And we're going to follow Jesus during the season of Lent to a cross, the most surprising of places where Jesus gives us exactly what we need. If we admit we're sinners in need of a savior, that's when we find God at the most deeply profound places and the deepest, most profound levels. The new covenant, the way, the truth, and the life. When I was in college, um, my wife was a student at Concordia College with me and a bunch of other friends in Moorhead, Minnesota, and we would have minor celebrities stop by once in a while, do concerts and give talks. Robert Goulet showed up at Concordia College. That's what he looked like in the 1980s. He was a Broadway star. He was in Camelot with Julie Andrews and Richard Burton, and he was famous, and then he became kind of infamous when Will, Will, Will Ferrell did an impression of him on Saturday Night Live about a thousand times. I had dinner with Robert Goulet. I know, I'm pretty amazing, aren't I? But I didn't do one thing to earn it. Not one thing. My wife did. She saw his limo pull up and his wife and I get out and go into the field house to start rehearsal for the concert he was giving that night at our college. And if you know Sally, this isn't gonna surprise you, she ran in after him and said, Robert Goulet! And says, I'm Sally. She had me at, I'm Sally, right? That's it for me. And she got Robert Goulet and his wife too, because she said, they said, where are, you do, where are you going? She said, well, I'm going to my communication theory class. You should come. I was in that class with Sally. And here comes Sally walking to the room, which always made my day. But then she, right behind her is Robert Goulet and his wife. They come walking in to dream the impossible dream, Goulet. And he, he's, this is Robert Goulet in flesh and blood. It's really him. And he, he talks to our professor, he talks to our class a little bit, and he says, hey, 
Sally, my wife and I want to take you out to dinner tonight. You can bring all your friends. Well, I was dating her, so I'm one of her friends. I did nothing to earn dinner with Robert Goulet, but I'm also here to tell you, he's nothing like the Will Ferrell impression. He and his wife were sweet. They paid for dinner for all of us. There's like eight of us had dinner with Robert Goulet and his wife at the Radisson in Fargo, North Dakota. Goulet. When I woke up in the morning, if one of my roommates would have said, you're gonna have dinner with Robert Goulet tonight and your future wife and his wife and a bunch of her friends, I would have said, there's no possible way. Sometimes I think we just go through the motions of this meal and we forget who we're having dinner with. It's better than Robert Goulet. His name is Jesus. In the night in which he's betrayed, he took bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it for all to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this to remember me. We haven't done one thing to earn this meal. Not one thing. It's bought and paid for by the Savior of the world. What if when you took communion today, you had that in mind? I'm having dinner with Jesus. I'm having dinner with the God who made me and loves me so much he sent his son to die for me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new, come on, Bible readers, this cup is the new covenant. In my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. What if it was that? For, what if you believed it and received it with that faith, knowing that you're having dinner in communion with your sisters and brothers in Christ here in Iowa and in Africa as the replica of a church that we're building in Africa, one of hopefully hundreds of churches? starts to take shape as we move toward Easter and our resurrection hope? What if you realize, what if you had a sense, wow, this meal's the biggest meal I'm gonna eat all week? I mean, small, it's a little wafer of bread and really, really cheap wine because we are good stewards of your offering dollars. But it's who's in the bread and who's in the wine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of all your sins. Even if you're going the wrong way, get in line and be made new. Not just someday in heaven. Today's the day of your salvation. Amen. I invite the communion servers to come forward. Together we're going to pray our Lord's Prayer, our table grace before this communion meal. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever, amen. Everybody's welcome who believes Christ is present in this meal. The only people who don't need it are those who are living a perfect life and don't have any need to turn around from anything. But understand who you're having dinner with. His name is Jesus, he's your savior and with your sisters and brothers in Christ. Understand that it's not the bread and the wine or the white grape juice, it's Jesus is in it. And when you believe it and receive it, it's done to you. Come and eat, come and drink, the table is set. If you want allergy free or over by the big windows on either side of the worship center, just get in line there. Everybody else get in the line. Ushers, you can start uh, getting people in line to come and receive, take the bread, receive the body of Christ. Then the red wine has alcohol in it. The white, white grape juice has no alcohol in it. Choose accordingly, whatever is your preference. Most of all, understand that Jesus is present in this meal and that his love is being poured out for you here. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for Service Online. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We don't think it's any accident that you're here and we have been praying for you. To see more of our content, know when we go live and stay up to date week to week, feel free to subscribe to this channel. And if you live close by one of our campuses or local sites, we invite you to check us out in person. We would love to meet you. And don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date. See you next week.